Uh, with great pleasure, I'm opening this session that uh, would address the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that uh, deals with uh, settlements of Iranian uh, nuclear pro problem. Uh, we will talk about achievements uh, of uh, JCPOA after uh, its uh, adoption in 2015, uh, the obstacles that uh, we are facing, and uh, let's talk about what has to be done uh, to uh, support uh, sustainability of this agreement. Uh, uh, we have uh, put our agenda together well in advance, and uh, we did not expect uh, new uh, changes in the U.S. policy that have been announced last week. Uh, I would appreciate it if we could uh, close the door on the left so that the people who are uh, coming in would not disturb us. Uh, let's keep only the back door open. Uh, could uh, somebody take care of that, please? Let us keep the door on the left closed. Uh, why uh, JCPOA is so important? The first agreement that has been reached in Vienna uh, was the biggest success story uh, for non-proliferation regime in the last uh, 30 years, almost. Probably since uh, the uh, uh, decision of South Africa uh, to uh, join uh, NPT. I would not uh, compare the state of nuclear uh, program in South Africa to the uh, Iranian nuclear uh, program. I'm talking about the significance of that event. Uh, we um, have had long negotiations, and uh, that stressed the importance of multilateral approach. Um, this was a proof of the effectiveness of international organizations, uh, Security Council. Uh, in today's conditions, uh, the uh, new negative trends uh, with uh, regard uh, to uh, uh, JCPOA uh, that we get from uh, some capitals are very uh, concerning and alerting. So it's a great honor uh, for us that uh, the architects of that agreement, uh, people who have been directly involved in preparation and development of this document, are here with us. We all know uh, that IA plays a key role in. Uh, verifications uh, of the agreements that have been reached. Let me remind to you that uh, every presenter is going to have uh, approximately seven minutes uh, for a statement. I uh, suggest that you stay in your seats. If you want uh, to uh, come to the lectern, though, you are most welcome to use it. Uh, following that, uh, we will open the floor for questions and comments. Uh, please raise your hands uh, when you want uh, to uh, make a comment or ask a question. Once again, I uh, would encourage uh, the press that covers this session uh, to respect the panelists. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to pass the floor uh, to uh, Sergei Ryabkov, Deputy Foreign Minister of Russian Federation. He is being uh, directly involved in development uh, of the uh, JCPOA. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Anton. Uh, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's very nice to see all of you in this room in Moscow. And it's uh, very good uh, to see so many faces. Uh, that fills me with optimism. I see a lot of colleagues, a lot of friends, uh, people who are not indifferent uh, to uh, non-proliferation arms control. 
uh, JCPOA. I think this is uh, an important message. It shows uh, the responsibility uh, of the people in the audience with regard to what is going on in international relations and uh, the future development of the situation. I must once again say that uh, we appreciate this opportunity uh, to get together <coughs> and uh, spend uh, two days in interesting discussions. Sometimes they get really heated, but uh, those discussions and meetings are very useful anyway. Uh, we have very interesting discussions. We can communicate. We can see things uh, that uh, are uh, on top of the agenda uh, for the diplomatic community. We get a lot of energy. We uh, can say with confidence uh, that uh, Moscow Nonproliferation Conference has become a significant factor. Uh, an international factor in our efforts this year, um, we see that uh, it's a great success. Thank you very much. I am very pleased to welcome uh, Helga Schmidt, uh, Wendy Sherman, and Abbas Arakchi. I uh, am happy to uh, welcome uh, Cornel Feruta uh, and Tan Flopkov. Uh, has already uh, mentioned uh, him and uh, the role of IAEA that plays a key role in implementation of the agreements. Uh, back to business, though. Uh, first of all, uh, we have no doubt uh, that uh, Islamic Republic of Iran uh, strictly and faithfully uh, fulfills uh, all the conditions uh, of the agreement. As it has been publicly stated by the general director of IAEA, uh, Mr. Yuki Amano, this includes uh, the um, issue of access uh, to the uh, relevant uh, sites uh, in Iran in the context of additional protocol application uh, that is an additional protocol to uh, JCPOA and uh, safeguards agreement. Uh, against this backdrop, uh, we have been uh, very upset uh, to see that the positive dynamics of uh, JCPOA implementation has not uh, kept uh, President Trump of the United States uh, from not uh, confirming uh, the uh, compliance of uh, the uh, requirements by Iran. We think this is an irresponsible decision. It's irresponsible not only with regard to uh, the uh, plan of actions uh, per se, and uh, the United States are a participant to this plan. It's irresponsible with regard to the entire international community that has supported uh, JCPOA when uh, Security Council Resolution uh, 2231 has been passed. It turns out uh, that the United States uh, once again have uh, uh, taken uh, the uh, issue of uh, world security and uh, made it a hostage uh, to uh, their own interests. And uh, it has become a matter uh, for review, uh, for politicians, uh, for the people who are, in essence, uh, quite far away uh, from this agreement and its content. Uh, we are viewing the actions of President Trump as a reflection of some uh, domestic uh, U.S. Uh, situation. We um, hope that emotions and uh, political situation will not uh, dominate. We hope uh, that our common uh, need uh, to uh, strengthen nonproliferation regime 
create uh, conditions for uh, proper uh, trade and economic relations uh, between uh, countries, support uh, international and regional peace and stability will prevail. The United States should not forget about their responsibility uh, for global and regional uh, security and stability. Uh, United States as a member of the Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, we believe that uh, over two years of uh, JCPOA implementation have demonstrated that the plan works and uh, it uh, completely handles uh, the goals that have been set for it. There is no alternative uh, to the plan. We uh, don't see uh, any possibilities or grounds uh, for uh, changing anything or making adjustments. JCPOA holds uh, a fragile balance of interests uh, that uh, touch upon fundamental uh, issues of security uh, for the participants. Uh, any shift in this balance would uh, inevitably uh, bring to the collapse of this mechanism. Putting it back together in a new configuration would not be possible. Uh, JCPOA cannot be fixed because uh, all the issues uh, that needed to be settled have been settled in one way or another. If it's not a perfect agreement uh, from standpoint of balance of interest, it's very close to it, very close to perfect. Russia is uh, not uh, prepared to participate uh, in any negotiations uh, with the purpose of some kind of improvement. In the conditions when Iran uh, fulfills all its commitments, uh, we uh, exclude any possibility uh, of resuming uh, Security Council sanctions. It's important for us that uh, along with the prospects that uh, JCPOA opened for broad international cooperation with Iran in different spheres, it also uh, creates a situation when IEA uh, can uh, make a final confirmation uh, of the uh, completely peaceful nature of Iranian nuclear program. Uh, to support this process, uh, the agreement has a number of constraints that Iran uh, has agreed to commit to. And uh, there are also mechanisms uh, for a high level of control uh, from IEA. I would like to uh, stress the fact that Russia has always uh, trusted uh, its uh, uh, neighbor and friend, Iran and its statements that its uh, nuclear program follows only peaceful purposes. Some countries, though, had some concerns uh, with that regard. There's been uh, questions uh, for Tehran in IAEA. We hope uh, that all uh, measures uh, in uh, JCPOA and also use of an additional protocol in Iran uh, would allow uh, to address these issues. The most important thing is that uh, within uh, JCPOA uh, we have uh, not only the control and verification measures uh, we need uh, to fully implement uh, the entire potential of that deal. Uh, that includes recovery of normal uh, trade and economic uh, cooperation with Iran uh, for stable, non-politicized uh, uh, functioning of the supplies channel of uh, goods uh, of nuclear and dual use. Uh, that is equally relevant uh, to uh, the uh, sphere of cooperation uh, in the domain of peaceful use of nuclear energy. Uh, one of these days, uh, Rosatom Corporation, uh, together with the Foreign Ministry of Russia, uh, has uh, hosted a Russian-Iranian uh, workshop uh, to commemorate the 25th uh, anniversary of our cooperation uh, in the uh, domain of peaceful use of uh, nuclear energy. Uh, with the uh, focus on the prospects of expansion of this cooperation uh, within uh, 
Annex 3 uh, to JCPOA. Other uh, colleagues will talk more about that. Russia will continue uh, to uh, fulfill its commitments uh, with regard to JCPOA. Uh, we uh, plan to uh, continue to implement uh, the uh, project of production of uh, stable isotopes at Fordo facility. For all that, we need to have a stable and uh, uh, forecastable political uh, situation. I think and we believe that uh, calm and routine uh, implementation of uh, JCPOA would uh, serve our interests and the interests of international stability. Uh, we believe that uh, with uh, inevitable differences uh, in assessment of uh, what is going on, uh, taking into consideration the statements made uh, by the U.S. side, uh, all uh, JCPOA participants uh, are united in uh, their wish uh, to uh, maintain uh, the plan and fully implement it. Based on that uh, most important task, Russian side uh, will be prepared to cooperate uh, with our uh, JCPOA partners. We are prepared uh, to work professionally uh, to look for solutions uh, to issues and challenges uh, that emerge and that we are facing at the current uh, period. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sergey Alexeyevich. And now I would like to pass the floor to another uh, architect of this extremely important uh, agreement uh, known as JCPOE, uh, Secretary General of European External uh, Action Service, uh, Mrs. Helge Schmidt. Thank you very much. Uh, um, it's my pleasure to be here. It's a very timely uh, conference. Uh, uh, because we are facing unprecedented threats, unfortunately also in the non-proliferation domain. Um, I'm very happy uh, to have this opportunity because, as you probably all know, the European Union, our member states have always been at the forefront in promoting the global non-proliferation architecture. We've always been staunch supporters of the IEA and the very important role the IEA is playing as, an impartial, um, as the impartial uh, agency that promotes the standards uh, we have achieved. Uh, and in that respect, the GCPOA has become a key pillar of the non-global uh, of the uh, global non-proliferation uh, agenda, and it is delivering. It is delivering 100% on its goals and uh, on its objectives. I'll come to that in a moment, but just allow me to say that I'm also very happy to be here because, as Sergei was saying, I'm with my co-panelists, who are all very familiar because we spent so much time together, particularly in the last months that led to the um, conclusion of the GCPOA. And also because the EU played a, a particular role, not only because it was uh, uh, three European countries, Germany, France and UK, who actually launched negotiations. And I, I had the privilege to be part of this in autumn 2003 uh, when I worked as chief of staff for the then German foreign minister and when we launched negotiations uh, in, in, in Tehran. If you had told me at that moment that it would take 12 more years before we could come to an agreement, and also probably very few uh, um, would predict, had predicted that we would be successful, but we were successful. And even more so, we proved all the critics wrong. Because again, not only did we achieve uh, uh, the GCPOA, it's also uh, delivering 100%. I'm coming from Brussels. I arrived, I arrived late last night. Our leaders met. We had a European Council. Our foreign ministers had a meeting on Monday. And uh, you may have seen they issued a declaration at 28. And the key message of this declaration is that at the time of acute nuclear threat, the European Union is determined uh, to uh, preserve the GCPA as a key pillar of the international non-proliferation architecture. This is a key sentence uh, uh, adopted by all 28. I agree with Sergei very much. There is no alternative to the agreement. There is definitely no way to renegotiate it. If you look at it, it's a very, very detailed document, more than 100 pages. It's a very technical. Um, it, it's very clear in terms of um, what Iran had to do. 
uh, on the nuclear side. It's also very clear in terms of what we have to do. I will not talk about um, uh, today what uh, we had done on our side, the lifting of nuclear-related sanctions for the EU, US and the UN, but this was uh, the other part of the uh, equation. It's a, it's a document uh, that addresses uh, the uh, technical issues in detail. Sergei uh, mentioned uh, Fordo. We are very grateful uh, to our Russian colleagues uh, for the very important role they are playing um, uh, when it comes to the stable isotope uh, uh, project. Um, but for me, what is absolutely important is um, the, um, and this is why I think that this is a sustainable agreement, this is the, um, uh, the strong monitoring, verification in, and uh, transparency measures that are included in the agreement. I'm saying this because there's a lot of criticism out there these days. Um, Sergei mentioned the, the uh, decision by the US president not to certify anymore. You probably have seen what the three leaders said on this, and it's not very often that you have the German Chancellor, the uh, 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 British Prime Minister and the French President uh, to issue declarations uh, together. They did so, they took note of the decision of the President not to certify anymore. They uh, raised their concerns about possible implications. They put it also in the context of our uh, security, Europe's security. I think this is a very strong message. We have taken note of this decision, as I said. We consider it an internal uh, US uh, um, uh, 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 process. For us, it's very clear. It cannot impact on the GCPA. We expect, also as coordinators of the Joint Commission, we expect all parties to continue to implement uh, all parts of the, uh, the agreement. But coming back uh, to the more uh, uh, nuclear uh, aspects, to the non-proliferation side, the fact that we have in place very clear uh, long-term uh, verification monitoring measures, I think gives us the necessary guarantees that this is a sustainable agreement. There's also a lot of confusion uh, out there about, um, uh, about the duration, the talk about sunset clauses. Let me be very clear also, there is no sunset clause. Uh, this is an agreement with different durations. Some of it is forever. Uh, Iran is already provisionally applying the additional protocol pending its final uh, ratification. This is, this, is, this is forever. There are some enhanced verification measures that, uh, for example, on the monitoring of uranium mining that go for 25 years. So this is an, an agreement with different durations and uh, any talk about sunset clauses, renegotiation, um, uh, to be very clear, this is definitely not an, an, an option. Again, I also already mentioned the, the very important role of the IEA. It is for the IEA uh, to um, uh, monitor the, um, uh, the implementation of the commitments taken by Iran. This is for us the only relevant uh, uh, instance. The IEA has issued eight reports so far. Um, uh, reports that um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, verify the commitments and, um, and uh, this is why the, uh, as far as we are concerned is this is an agreement that is uh, delivering on all its objectives. Mm. The question was also about long-term sustainability and, and here um, I would just like to highlight also not to be too long the area of civil nuclear cooperation which is our um, famous Annex 3. This is for us uh, very important because it, um, is, it creates a win-win situation. It makes the agreement durable by also increasing transparency through international uh, activities. The European Union is very much engaged. Um, we, um, there is one issue I would like to highlight, and this is uh, the, um, our objective for Iran to align with international standards in the legislative and regulatory fields. We did a, a seminar on this in, in Brussels earlier this year, which we felt was very successful. I'm very much looking forward to a follow-up uh, seminar in Isfahan in, in, in November. Uh, we've also started projects in support of the Iranian Nuclear R Regulatory Authority. There are ongoing contacts to have Iran participate in the Eurotom framework um, uh, uh, projects. Um, what I'm saying is, and um, this is part of the uh, sustainability issue, the, the agreement is embedded in a broad range of um, the European Union's re-engagement with Iran, 
there's a wide uh, spectrum. Just, I just want to highlight the field of energy, where we, for example, had organized the first ever Iran-EU business forum on sustainable energy in Tehran in April. Uh, again, a very successful event uh, to promote uh, clean energy, renewables, energy efficiency. I will myself go to Tehran again in, in November. I will bring quite a lot of colleagues from the Commission because the area of our engagement, um, be it energy, be it agriculture, uh, research, technology, uh, macroeconomics is, is very important. We also support, by the way, uh, Iran's reintegration into the world economy. WTO, for example, is, is a very important point. All this, um, I think, will guarantee that um, uh, from our point of view, the agreement is sustainable. But again, this agreement is working, it's delivering, it is not a bilateral agreement. It is, a, it is an agreement that was endorsed by a Security Council uh, a resolution. Uh, Federica Mogherini, the High Representative, who has uh, a special role as coordinator of the Joint Commission, says it belongs to the international community. And for the European Union, I can only say that we have every interest to protect this agreement and we will continue to protect this agreement. Thank you very much. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much, Madam Smith. As I mentioned, uh, we have a number of uh, GCPOE architects at this panel today. So I'd like to uh, give the floor to Ambassador Sherman, who contributed a great deal to the preparation of this uh, agreement. At the time, she was uh, Senior Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. At the moment, she's Senior Fellow at the Beaufort Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard. Thank you for being with us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. And uh, let me start by taking a moment first to say I'm not a government official. Uh, I'm here as an individual, and I'm here among colleagues. I, I want to take a moment and just recognize all the people on this stage, along with the British, French, German counterparts. We all have spent literally thousands of hours when all is said and done with each other. And it is an extraordinary tribute led by Helga and first Kathy Ashton and then Federico Mogherini in truly an extraordinary effort. And I just would like to take a moment before I explain where the United States of America is to applaud all of my colleagues for just an extraordinary undertaking supported by the United Nations and by the international uh, world. So please, I applaud you all. Uh, I think that's important because, uh, as Helga pointed out, this is not a bilateral agreement between the United States and Iran. This is an agreement reached by the P5 plus 1. They call it the E3 plus 3, but we call it the P5 plus 1, uh, and the European Union, uh, and then endorsed by 15 to nothing by the UN Security Council and supported by the entire international community. And it's important that we understand that because it has implications not just for this agreement that was reached with Iran, and Iran is now a uh, participant of the Joint Commission, an equal participant in the Joint Commission that oversees this effort for peaceful use of nuclear power, of civil nuclear power. And it is a very important example to everyone else who may aspire to have nuclear weapons that there is indeed an alternative that preserves peace and security in the world and the ability to prosper economically and to prosper in the security of a country. So I hope all countries in the world take note of the example that was taken here uh, by Iran and the P5 plus 1 in the European Union uh, to achieve this. Now, uh, I know that there is a, a tremendous... Uh, attention to what the United States is doing. And uh, I am obviously a patriot of my country. Uh, I believe in the United States of America. I believe in the resilience of our system. And as I was talking with Abbas about, uh, CNN just reported a poll that was taken in September uh, that shows the two and th 
two out of every three Americans, two-thirds of all Americans, believe that the United States should stay in the JCPOA. Uh, this includes 48% of Republicans. Uh, it includes 67% of independents and 80% of Democrats. So the American public, no matter who you are, believes that we should stay in this deal. I think the President of the United States knew that when he decertified but did not encourage the United States Congress to snap back the sanctions. Uh, there's a very complex political dance going on in my country. And so let me try to explain what I think will happen. The President said, uh, did not dispute that Iran has technically complied with the agreement. It is impossible to say that Iran has not complied with the agreement. There are eight IAEA reports, as Helga mentioned, that says that Iran has complied with the agreement and that all parties, quite frankly, have complied with the agreement. I know Abbas will say that the United States has not fully complied. I completely expect that. We understand each other quite well. Um, but uh, what he said is that Iran has not complied with the spirit. This agreement has nothing to do with spirit. <laughs> There's nothing spiritual about this agreement. <laughs> this agreement is completely about nuts and bolts, verification and monitoring, specifics, 159 detailed pages. I am not a nuclear physicist. I have no desire to be one. I respect all of you who are. Uh, I know more about this than I ever wanted to know. Uh, so it's quite detailed. Uh, it has nothing to do with spirit. The president is also quite concerned about Iran's activities, uh, particularly in the Middle East, state sponsorship of terrorism, <clears throat> um, the uh, launching of uh, missiles, uh, the trading of weapons, uh, and uh, human rights uh, in, in Iran. I share some of those concerns, but this agreement is not about that. This agreement is to ensure that Iran does not obtain a nuclear weapon, and it achieves that. And I give, as I said at the beginning of this, all of the parties, including Iran, enormous credit for having achieved such an agreement. So what happens now? What happens now is the United States Congress has 60 days in which to decide whether to step back the U.S. sanctions. That happens under what are called expedited procedures, which means that it takes only 50 votes in the U.S. Senate, not the usual 60. There is no cloture vote, which I'm happy to explain to anybody who wants to understand all of our crazy rules. So it only takes 50 votes. My sense is this is not what will happen. I think the president does not want to leave the deal. He just wants Congress to take responsibility for it, not him. Uh, and so what I do think will happen, however, is that the Congress will consider other legislation that doesn't happen under the 60-day procedure. There is a piece of legislation called uh, Corker Cotton by Senators Corker and Senator Cotton uh, that creates new triggers for um, the sanctions snapping back. In my view, this legislation is an attempt to unilaterally renegotiate the deal. I don't think, in my view, that is acceptable. Uh, I believe that uh, there are many uh, in the Senate who agree with that posture, even some who voted against the deal in the first instance because they believe the deal is working and they don't want to get out of it. But we will have a battle uh, to ensure that such a legislation does not pass. Right now, it has no bipartisan sponsorship. Uh, and uh, I, I would not expect the legislation as it currently stands to get bipartisan support, but again, it will be a difficult battle. Uh, people are working very hard to ensure that this does not go any place that creates a situation where this deal falls apart. We think it is quite important. The president says he cares about America's vital national security, and in my view, uh, it is vital to America's national security that the JCPOA continue. I want to uh, take one more moment uh, to salute uh, the European Union. Uh, as Helga mentioned, Europe has been stalwart 
uh, in support of this on Capitol Hill. Uh, and most in America uh, do not want to do anything that will breach the transatlantic relationship. So this is an important strength. And the one last point I'll make is any legislation like Corker Cotton has to achieve 60 votes. Uh, so it is a higher bar uh, to get it passed, which is a good thing uh, because it makes it more difficult to do. I'm happy to answer questions as we go forward, but what I mainly want to do is to salute the enormous work of not only the people on this stage, but our partners, and literally thousands of people when you add up all the people in our governments and the IAEA who have worked to achieve this. So thank you. And Mr. Sherman, thank you very much indeed. Now, before I give the floor to yet another uh, JCPOE architect, I'd like to bring your attention to the words uttered by Ambassador Sherman. She talked about the spirit of the agreement. You know, many colleagues, American colleagues, including those present in this room, claim that Iran, uh, when it launches its missiles, uh, violates the spirit of the agreement. So this comment on the part of Ambassador Sherman is crucial indeed. She is one of the uh, mother founders of this agreement, if you will, and this is absolutely important to hear uh, such a statement from her. Either we stick to the language or we talk about the spirit of the agreement. Now, it is my great honor to give the floor to Deputy Foreign Minister for Legal and International Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, he also uh, was absolutely instrumental in hammering out this agreement, Dr. Abbas Arakchi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. A very good morning to all of you. I'm so glad to be amongst you today. Uh, let me to join others to thank uh, Center for <coughs> Energy and Security Studies and our friend uh, Halepkov for organizing this meeting. I'm especially thankful to him for uh, organizing this panel on JCPOA and for the composition of this panel. It's really uh, feel good to be <coughs> once again with the colleagues. We worked together for about two and a half years, uh, days after days, hours after hours, as was mentioned, even uh, late sessions till mornings. Uh, so we really did a very difficult job, and I, I, I'm so glad to be once again among these uh, very good colleagues. Well, we had, a very, uh, we had a common goal at that time to achieve JCPOA. Now we have another common goal to save it. Uh, I have to say that uh, before I start to raise uh, some points with you, I have to say that I share and endorse everything which was said by the colleagues about JCPOA. And I tell you, this never happened during the negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but now, as I said, we have a common goal to save and protect JCPOA. Well, some comments. <clears throat> First of all, I fully agree that now JCPOA is a key pillar or a, a, a part and parcel of the non-proliferation regime. And uh, if it fails, actually, it would be a failure for NPT, failure for non-proliferation regime. Why it is so important for, uh, for uh, non-proliferation domain and regime is because this document uh, deals with a very important uh, proliferation issue in a balanced way. And this is why it is uh, highly acceptable uh, by all parties. Uh, at least two pillars of NPT uh, are dealt with in a balanced way in this, uh, in this deal. <coughs> the non-proliferation and peaceful use of nuclear technology. This is very, very important. The deal makes sure that there is no proliferation in Iran's nuclear program. At the same time, the deal fully respects Iran's right for peaceful use of nuclear technology and to exercise that, that, uh, that right. <clears throat> so that can be a very good model for other countries who want to follow because the deal is, in fact, uh, 
dealing with a very important part of non-proliferation regime. The other point I want to raise is what uh, Helga mentioned, that there is no uh, sunset clause in the deal. And I would also like to uh, affirm that, that Iran's commitment not to, go, not to go for nuclear weapons is permanent in the deal. I read you paragraph three of the preamble. Iran reaffirms that under no circumstances will Iran ever seek, develop, or acquire any nuclear weapon. And there is no sunset for this. This is a permanent commitment by Iran in the JCPOA. There are some time-limited restrictions, as was mentioned. But what are the purpose of those restrictions? What happened after uh, the, the finish of those restrictions? Some say that Iran would go for the bomb after that. But, but it's, not the, it's not the case. It's not true. When these restrictions are finished, Iran would become a normal member of NPT. And like any other uh, non-nuclear uh, weapon state of uh, NPT should remain committed to the obligations of NPT. Even more, if everything goes well and all parties remain committed to their obligations in the JCPOA, see, uh, after six years from now, Iran would ratify additional protocol. An additional protocol which is now voluntarily implemented would become a permanent uh, obligation for Iran. So there is no sunset clause. Iran's commitment in the JCPOA uh, not to go for nuclear weapon is, is permanent. The second point is we in the group during the negotiations uh, intentionally, intentionally decided to delink any other issue with the Iran's nuclear program. So we negotiated only on Iran's peaceful nuclear program not any other issue. And that was a, uh, an in, uh, intentional decision by all of us. Had we linked any other issue to the negotiations, I'm sure still we would have negotiating and it, it would be never-ended negotiations. So uh, I think it is important to keep this line. If we relate anything, any other issue, to the, uh, to the JCPOA, it looks like that we say that, uh, you know, NPT would be, NPT in, in general would be successful if, for example, Palestinian issue is resolved. Its human rights is respected. That would be as ridiculous as we say that JCPOA should be, should be uh, implemented uh, in a way that all other issues, all other regional issues is, is also dealt with. Some says, that there is a provision in the JCPOA which says that uh, JCPOA should contribute to the peace and stability of, of the region and international, uh, internationally and, and regionally. I read the sentence for you, which is in the preface of, of the, uh, the deal. The participants, they <coughs> anticipate that full implementation of this JCPOA will positively contribute to regional and international peace and security. So first of all, it's not a provision, it's an anticipation of what may happen in the future as a result. Secondly, it, is, it says that full implementation of JCPOA, and full implementation is after 10 years, it's not now. And thirdly, I can still say that implementation of JCPOA, JCPOA even not fully, even after two years, has contributed to the peace and stability in our region. At least we have now one less problem in our region, which is full of chaos and difficult conflicts and, and problems. Just imagine what would be the situation in our region if we had also a, a nuclear crisis uh, in Iran. And uh, my last point, which is uh, really important. Uh, everybody mentioned about Iran's compliance to the, to the deal. Uh, I want to add that it's a fact that the U.S. United States has not complied to its obligations in the JCPOA. And this is totally unacceptable. The United States has constantly violated the JCPOA. 
not the spirit of JCPOA, the letter of the JCPOA. I, I just read from the JCPOA and leave the judgment to you. Paragraph 26. The U.S. will take best efforts in good faith to sustain this JCPOA and to prevent interference with the realization of the full benefit by Iran of the sanctions lifting. Paragraph 28. The E3, EU plus 3, the participants, and Iran commit to implement this JCPOA in good faith and in a constructive atmosphere and to refrain from any action inconsistent with the letter, the spirit, and intent of this JCPOA that would undermine its successful implementation. Senior government officials of the E3 EU plus 3 will make every effort to support the successful implementation of this JCPOA, including in their public statements. So any public statement by President Trump is a violation of, of the JCPOA. Anything he says against JCPOA is a violation of the deal. His speech in the General Assembly in front of the world leaders was an obvious violation of JCPOA. The letter, not the spirit. And worse than all, in the past nine months, the United States has created a very negative atmosphere around JCPOA and around, and around Iran. And that undermines successful implementation of JCPOA. They are committed to, to create, a, to implement JCPOA in a constructive atmosphere. <coughs> But the atmosphere they have created is, not, is, is, is destructive. They have kept the whole business community in the world in an atmosphere of uncertainty and confusion. So nobody is interested to work with Iran. There is no dividends for Iran because everybody is just waiting. And this at most negative atmosphere created by the U.S. administration is, in fact, violation of the JCPOA, preventing Iran from benefiting from sanctions lifting, and I tell you it is totally unacceptable, and it will have its consequences. The situation is as bad in Tehran as, in, as it is in Washington, I have to tell you. And we have to, very care, to be very careful of what we do in the future. I should confirm at the end that as colleagues said, we don't see any possibility for renegotiation, for any addition, for any annex, for any add-on, for anything uh, for the JCPOA. It should be implemented in full and Iran should be benefited from the, from the dividends of, of this deal, otherwise uh, we would have serious problem. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Arakchi. Uh, I want to emphasize one very, very important message sent by both Dr. Arakchi and Ambassador Sherman. One important part of the deal, one important uh, part of uh, the success was the ability to delink the core issue from all the other issues. Yes, they are uh, important maybe, but uh, they should be addressed uh, under a different format. Now, when we talk about possible uh, similar agreements in other regions to defuse tensions, including the respect to the nuclear field, I think this is a most important uh, model that we all should employ. But for the uh, agreement uh, to delink the core issue from all the others, as Dr. Archie put it, the negotiators would have still uh, been negotiating in Geneva and in other capitals. Now, when we talk about the Korean Peninsula, I think this is uh, the approach that appears fair and pertinent. Now, let me give the floor to the next panelist. As I mentioned, uh, without IAEA, without verification, without uh, inspections on the part of an independent uh, international organization, it's hard to imagine the future of uh, this deal. Therefore, uh, I'd like to uh, express my sincere gratitude to Ambassador Feruta. Thank you for being with us. IAEA has been instrumental in implementing uh, the deal 
uh, because you perform the verification function. Uh, so I'd appreciate uh, uh, your thoughts, your vision as to where we stand at the moment and what are the prospects for the deal uh, uh, from the standpoint of the IAEA. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anton. <clears throat> I, I feel like this session is one of the probably most privileged session of the conferences, of, of the whole conference, and that's because I'm privileged to share this uh, podium with two terrific ladies that um, made a very strong contribution to, to this important deal. And secondly, because I think it's a quite rare sight to see the architects, and I'm looking to my right, uh, of the deal um, on the same stage and agreeing on all the issues that they are saying. Um, and I think it's also this uh, panel represents a bit the institutional memory of the JCPO negotiations. And Helga started <clears throat> with the, um, uh, a recourse to her historical memory in 2003 when the first issue started uh, to be addressed. And I think that's quite important to restate where we are and where we are today. And um, the Iranian nuclear issue has a long history. And the history before getting to the agreement was pretty rough, very complicated, and um, with many bumps on the road. So it started in 2003. And I think uh, we all remember how difficult that was when the IA Director General at the time presented a report to the June uh, 2003 Board of Governors. Subsequently, the board deciding to seize the Security Council in 2006, and with a number of IEA Board of Governors uh, resolutions and UN Security Council resolutions that followed. And I think uh, throughout the period there were a number of initiatives that um, um, were tested but uh, little was delivered. And we all remember that international, uh, international tension rose to, um, to quite um, uh, high limits, um, at times to dangerous, uh, very dangerous levels. Now, we could see that changing and the atmosphere and the climate and the um, openness for conversation and discussions in, um, in 2003. And I don't know how many of us remember, but the JCPOA was preceded by the joint plan of action and by parallel negotiations between Iran and the IEA uh, on the framework for cooperation. At the same time, in October 2003, uh, when the IEA and Iran agreed the framework for cooperation, uh, almost at the same time, there was an agreement between the ECPLA3 and Iran on the JPA. Uh, which um, uh, created already the certain level of predictability that allowed both Iran and the agency to, uh, to look at uh, what can be done to address concerns that the agency um, um, expressed. Um, and for, for the next year and a half, there are two separate strands of negotiations, each of them supporting um, uh, themselves, and we were able to provide technical advice to, uh, to, the, uh, um, uh, to the process, uh, the plus 3 and Iran. And um, um, luckily, at the end of the day, uh, this twin-track approach uh, proved to be um, uh, successful in moving things forward. Now, what has happened after July 2015 um, is not only that the plus 3 and Iran agreed on the JCPOA, it is crucial that the Security Council endorsed the JCPOA and it is crucial that the IA Board of Governors uh, authorized the Director General to monitor and verify the implementation of the nuclear-related commitments. And I think for the IA, this is the mandate, this is the, uh, the framework that guides the work of the agency. Uh, the Security Council resolution and the uh, Board of Governors um, authorization and um, request. And um, uh, we will continue to do so as, as long as these requests uh, remain valid. We all talk about the JCPOA um, only, but I have to say that the overall framework that guides the relationship between Iran and the IEA is completed also by what we call the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement and the Additional Protocol. And Iran, as of the implementation day, also provisionally applies the Additional Protocol, and that's a very important instrument. It's a very powerful instrument that allows the IEA um, um, more access more visits and more interaction together with the Iranian experts uh, on the implementation of its uh, obligation. Um, also, again, I don't know how many of us remember that there, um, for many years, an important issue was pending, which is called the possible military dimensions. 
um, which together with Iran we were able to address in parallel with these conversations and interaction we had um, on the uh, JPA, JCPOA and uh, the roadmap that was eventually agreed between the IEA and the agency. It's based on this roadmap and these activities that were agreed in July 2015. It was actually on the same day, a few hours before the JCPOA was signed. Uh, we signed, the Director General and uh, Vice President uh, Saleh, he signed the roadmap on addressing all these um, issues related to the possible military dimension. And in the subsequent month, we were able to clarify all these issues. And why I'm mentioning this is this because this facilitated, uh, enabled the implementation day of the JCPOA. And ever since, I think we started a new phase of cooperation with Iran since 16th of January 2015 uh, with the additional protocol and with the monitoring verification activities, um, um, we, we continue to follow, to follow that. Now, um, the Director General of the IE reported on numerous occasions after the implementation day, and most recently in August uh, this year, that the nuclear related commitments under the JCPOA uh, undertaken by Iran are implemented. And um, um, the IA will continue, and uh, this is what we do, will verify and monitor on the basis of the Security Council and the Board of Governance mandate uh, in an impartial way and very objectively the modalities um, uh, defined by the JCPOA and our own standards safeguards practice. And uh, I have to say that uh, the level of interaction and the level of monitoring that we have with Iran is unprecedented. Um, we have um, inspectors on the ground um, on every practic practical day, and uh, we, uh, we use advanced technologies in, in our work. And um, we have um, more information about Iranian nuclear program uh, now than we had before. Um, I also have to remind you that Iran is implementing the modified code 3.1, which is also important. That was one of the stumbling blocks, I think, uh, before the uh, J uh, JCPOA uh, entered into, into force. Um, from the IA point of view, and I think I'm saying this is from the IA point of view, uh, because I think here we echo the views of the IA Board of Governors and our member states, and from a verification point of view, the uh, JCPOA is a clear <coughs> gain. It's a net verification gain from a verification point of view. And I think uh, we could also see throughout the history of the 12 years before we got to, um, uh, to this agreement how much and how significant actually this is um, success for international diplomacy. It's a major achievement, I think. And um, um, it's a quite rare um, situation where the international community can cooperate in such a way the uh, E3 plus 3 and uh, Iran uh, guided by the European Union, their cooperation with the agency and our interaction uh, we had. So, of course, now there is uh, speculation about the future of the uh, JCPOA. And strictly from an IA perspective, we don't operate on the basis of speculation. Um, and I think as long as Iran uh, continues to cooperate with the agency and implement, on the one hand, the nuclear-related commitments under the JCPOA, and the commitments under the safeguards arrangement and the additional protocol, the reports of the Director General will reflect in a factual and impartial way this exact uh, reality. And I think um, as far as we are concerned, uh, we are very much glad to see that the support and the echo that we get from a number of actors on the type of work that the IA is doing, it's also a recognition of the impartiality and I think we will continue to do that. And uh, we would like to remain uh, what uh, some may call, um, you know, the ones that provide the reality check. And the reality is always included in the Director General's reports to the Board of Governors and the Security Council. Thank you, Anton. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Froda. We have 28 minutes exactly for Q&A. Uh, at 10.30 uh, sharp, we are going to bring the session to an end. So we're going to take four questions and then invite the panelists uh, to answer them. Ambassador Maryasov, 
Uh, please get the microphone over there. I'm Alexander Maryasov, a, a former ambassador to Iran. I have a question uh, for uh, Mrs. Helga Schmidt. Uh, do you think European countries will be able uh, to resist American pressure and continue uh, to uh, fulfill their obligations uh, within uh, JCPOA if uh, the U.S. leaves the deal and um, brings back uh, sanctions against Iran. Indeed, in 2003-2005, uh, uh, the three countries have had negotiations with Iran uh, on the Iranian uh, program. Those negotiations failed because the United States blocked uh, those negotiations by uh, setting forth unacceptable proposals uh, on complete discontinuation of all nuclear activities in Iran and dismantling of nuclear sites. We know uh, what uh, the uh, consequences were and how the situation uh, was developing afterwards. And we'll give the floor uh, to answer. Laura Lockwood, please. Laura Rockwood, Executive Director of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation, and previously a lawyer for the Department of Safeguards and uh, worked on the Iran file from 2003. We heard yesterday from uh, Sergei Lavrov that the IAEA has no authority to verify Section T on weaponization, and I'd be very, very interested in hearing from each of the panelists of their respective views on that. Dr. Kubik, next. Bernd Kubik, academic, Peace Orchestra, Middle East. I have two questions, but a comment first, and that is, I think the strategy to point to the strength of the JCPOA, what is in it, is very good, and is, it's, it's uh, I think, very sound. My quest, first question is, uh, even if one pursues this strategy, there is big, big criticism, and one of the points is missiles. And the question is, instead of excluding and ignoring the criticism, my question, first question to you is, to what extent do you think is it now important to focus on the missile issue in a win-win and balanced way? And that is not just criticizing, criticizing Iran, but getting another regional forum together with Israel and Saudi Arabia to fend off criticism. My second question is, I think it's very important to be now on Capitol Hill, but criticism is also progressing in the region among the Gulf states. But I see also here windows of opportunities because the schism between Saudi Arabia and Qatar indicates different positions towards Iran. So my question is, to what extent do you think is it possible to solidify the JCPOA by going beyond Oman and trying to bring other countries behind you as part of a strategy to solidify the JCPOA and increase its resilience? Thank you. Dr. Blix. I have two brief comments and one question. The first is that this is not a bilateral or a trilateral agreement. It is a decision by the Security Council of the United Nations. And we know that the Security Council's authority is based upon the agreement between the P5. I think that any, any, dis, any falling apart of the agreement will be a disaster for the authority of the UN. And when President Trump talked about the potential of the UN, he should protect that and he should improve it and not destroy it. The second point is about the IEA. I was in the, at the IEA when we developed the additional protocol. I'm happy to see it accepted in 1997, and I'm happy to see that it plays a big role now. It still requires a very great deal of integrity and strength from the IEA, professionality and integrity, and I trust that will be continued. Now I get to my question, and that is the question about the, whether the, the, the agreement and the decision will be a model in the field of non-proliferation. 
I somewhat doubt that. Iran was in a position when they had, had, had raised suspicions, understandable suspicions, because the program was too big, I think, for peaceful purposes. And this was settled through the agreement. They cut down the program in an agreement with the others. But will this be a model for, for the rest of the MPT members? Try to use it on Brazil, and I think you'll get a very clear answer. Thank you. I thank you all and I thank everyone for this interest. Uh, I don't believe I can uh, kind of improvise on what is possible and what is not in terms of solidifying this agreement uh, by working with the Gulf states one way or another. Uh, we took note, of course, uh, of the fact that a couple of Gulf states uh, sided with President Trump squarely in... Uh, putting questions about the validity of the, well, not the validity, about the future, let me be straightforward in the Russian assessment uh, of the deal. The others were more or less um, quiet or evasive. Uh, I think uh, the vast majority in the international community supports the line which all of you heard now from this podium from every single participant uh, in this panel. Uh, on Section T, uh, well, obviously being uh, Deputy to Minister Lavrov, I cannot say anything but to confirm what he has said. To be more specific, to be more specific on this though, sorry, I would say that um, there is a provision uh, in the arrangement uh, that allows to have a discussion uh, on the rules of IAEA in regard to Section T at the Joint Commission. My personal view is that uh, given the circumstances and depending on how things would evolve, uh, one may have a debate on this. Another issue is, of course, how the Iranian side would look into it. But this is exactly right, what Minister Lavrov said yesterday, that IA currently has no mandate to verify Section C. Uh, uh, if the GCPOA can serve as a model uh, to, anything less, uh, to anything else, I think uh, some of the approaches, some of the records from these negotiations uh, suit very well uh, to other difficult situations in the area of non-proliferation. And moreover, the good routines and the ways how we work together and communicated, at times forgetting uh, the national affiliation, let me be very frank with you, and focusing exclusively on the substance and how to deal with things, how to develop solutions. That is invaluable and that is something that should be remembered and cherished. Now, in substantial terms, I share the doubts with uh, Ambassador, of Ambassador Blix. I think in some cases we have a very different degree of advancement. We have in one case an obvious weaponization which in our national view was not the case at any given moment in Iran. So uh, the bets are much higher and this traditional standard step by step, that was the Russian invention as we all remember, the step by step <laughs> phrase. <laughs> well, uh, is not applicable now. We, uh, we need to find other ways to address the substance, we have to find different language and moreover, we have to find sufficient political w will on everyone involved to deal with this. On um, missiles, uh, that's um, one of the most contentious issues as everyone here understands. It has always been and it remains one of the most uh, tricky things. Uh, my only answer to this would be Russia is a strong proponent uh, of the establishment in the Middle East of a zone 
free for nuclear weapons, other weapons of mass destruction, and their means of delivery. To quote literally what was the title and essence of the well-known decisions of 1995 to extend NPT indefinitely. That's the key that we believe may unlock uh, this door. Easier said than done, but I don't have any reasonable offer to you on how it would be possible to deal with this diplomatically, proactively, constructively, rather than to continuously argue about things that go right to the core of national security of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and that creates the sense of insecurity in some other states, not included Russia. Ms. Schmidt. Thank you. Uh, on the question, is the GCPA a model? I would very much agree with what Sergei Ryabkov said. Uh, every situation is different, so you cannot just uh, transpose it into another situation. But I think the way it was done is definitely a model. It's, a, it's negotiations, it's a cooperative approach rather than confrontation. The fact that we were building trust and confidence, it's a very detailed agreement this, that, which does not leave any room for interpretation other than with maybe other um, uh, comparable ag agreements. And it's also created a win-win situation. It's, um, it's, um, uh, we asked Iran to do a lot, but also we offered um, uh, uh, quite a lot. So in that respect, I think the methodology definitely I would see as, 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 as a model. Uh, and it was negotiated by the European Union, which was um, uh, uh, probably the, uh, the, the, the one that could be uh, accepted as the neutral broker because we did, did not have any uh, specific or particular interests. The, um, the, the question uh, on, 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 on the missiles, I mean, I very much agree with uh, 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 what Wendy Sherman said before, also uh, my colleague Abbas. There is a reason why uh, issues and concerns we definitely have. Yes, we have concerns about ballistic missiles. We definitely feel that they do not contribute to confidence in, in the region. For the European Union, we have restrictions in place on missile technology till 2023 or um, um, the moment the IA draws the broader conclusion. We have also an arms embargo uh, in place. We feel that the um, uh, uh, ballistic missiles are not consistent with the relevant Security Council resolution, but they are outside the scope of the agreement, like regional issues uh, are outside the scope of the agreement. They have to be addressed, but in different forma, in different uh, formats. This is also a very clear message our, our uh, uh, foreign ministers gave. Um, do I believe in multilateral solutions? Yes. This is probably indeed an issue where uh, uh, you would uh, have to go, because it's an issue. Every country in the region has legitimate security interests. This goes for Iran, this goes for Saudi Arabia, the other Gulf countries, um, and this is probably the way that is for the future uh, 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 to address it. Uh, on section T, here um, uh, 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 my position is that all nuclear related commitments measures have to be implemented, they have to be monitored by the IEA. This is also set out in the relevant Security Council resolution 2231 and I've also noted that the IEA has confirmed in two reports that it is monitoring uh, section T. And then the first question which was probably only addressed to me is uh, I do not want to speculate. Um, I, uh, this is why I said that for us the, the decision uh, not to certify anymore, although the Trump administration has certified twice already, uh, we see it as an internal U.S. procedure. We expect every party to this uh, agreement uh, to continue to um, 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 stick to their uh, uh, commitments. This is very clear. For the, for the EU, we have been re-engaging. The, um, uh, particularly also when it comes to trade. We are actively uh, promoting trade. Uh, this was made possible through the agreement. There is re-engagement in, very, in various sectors. Um, also, um, we have, of course, a discussion internally, and um, uh, the, the only thing I can say is we are looking into ways also to protect our business operators' uh, interests. Thank you. Mm. So I think uh, Helga's made um, a lot of comments with which I would agree. So let me just add a couple of things. I think the strength of this was the clarity of the objective and the mission. If you all recall, uh, and, and Sergei, Sergei will remember this well, in the midst of this, uh, 
we all became quite concerned about Russia's decisions regarding Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And we all understood well that we had to keep our focus inside the room because we shared the objective for this negotiation that we were focused on working out an arrangement where Iran would not obtain a nuclear weapon. And there, it wasn't that there weren't other matters of tremendous importance to each of us. There were. And some very difficult moments, quite frankly. But if we brought all of those issues into the room, there would be no agreement. And the same would be said of U.S. concerns and shared by other colleagues here of ballistic missiles, of arms, of human rights, of state sponsorship of terrorism, because if all of those issues had been in the room, they would have been traded off against the nuclear issue. And so everything would have ended up with the least common denominator and no objective would have actually been achieved to the fullest to which it needed to be achieved. So I think what is important about this negotiation was the clarity of the objective and the relentless focus by everyone to keep that focus in the room, understanding that each country had additional objectives that were not in the room uh, that had to be dealt with but would be dealt with in other ways, in other venues. And I think that clarity above all else was critical to achieving uh, this agreement and achieving it in the depth and breadth in which it needed to be addressed um, uh, without dealing with other things. Section T, I quite agree with what Helga said, and I think uh, Cornell will be the best uh, uh, one to speak to Section T. Um, I do think that we all need to figure out a way to address the issue of ballistic missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons. Um, it's quite crucial. Uh, the only note I will make, since we've had a lot of discussion about North Korea here, is at the end of the Clinton administration, we were in the midst of uh, reaching an agreement with North Korea on the testing of long-range missiles. We had a moratorium, uh, and we were on our way perhaps to getting an agreement. Uh, we ran out of time. We had a contentious election in the United States that didn't get over till December instead of November. And I deeply regret uh, that I never got to go back to Pyongyang and get that deal done because I think we'd be in a very different place today. Thank you. Dr. Arch. Well, thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, first one comment on the first question which was addressed actually to Helga. Uh, it's not a secret that we uh, seriously expect the European Union and European countries to protect their companies and their business community to work with Iran. And, and this is what we seriously expect and we believe that this is very important for the survival of the <coughs> JCPOA. What happens if uh, the US uh, is out, is walked away? Can we continue with, with the Europeans? Of course, we are not at that point yet. But my personal view is without the US, the whole deal is, is collapsed and, and dismantled. Uh, on Section T, I fully agree with uh, Sergey, obviously. Uh, if you refer to paragraph 15 and 16, I, I, as far as I remember, maybe I make a mistake, but uh, uh, the mandate for the agency is in the JCPOA is clear, and we believe that Section T is not uh, a part of their mandate. <clears throat> but uh, but uh, I think uh, if there is any uh, debate or question needed to be addressed, the Joint Commission is the best place to deal with that. On missile question, well, uh, let me to uh, tell you very clearly that our missiles are the only reliable uh, defense capability of us. And they are absolutely for defense purposes. They are for deterrence. They are there to prevent another young Saddam Hussein in the region to make another miscalculation and, atta and attack Iran. They are totally out of the scope of JCPOA, and on this I just agree with what, I refer you to what Wendy and Helga said, that we 
decided to keep uh, any other issue out of the scope of JCPOA for reason. And finally, uh, I also believe that JCPOA can be a model. Of course, every situation is different, but the approach is important. The approach that we took in the JCPOA, a win-win approach, is a, is a, which, which was successful, is a big lesson, can be used in other uh, situations. And also, the approach we took in the JCPOA to make a very clear balance between rights and obligations in the NPT, which are both are respected in the JCPOA, I think can be uh, utilized in other uh, similar cases. Thank you. Ambassador Thank you. Thank um, you. Well, on Section T, um, the, the views already expressed here um, are quite um, um, clear and explain why the Director General of the IEA uh, said also publicly that continuing conversation with the Joint Commission will be important. From our perspective, uh, the Security Council uh, request, uh, which was um, again um, uh, authorized by the Board of Governance of the IEA, um, request the agency to monitor and verify all nuclear-related commitments, including Section T, and that was made clear in um, the June uh, 2017 and the August-September um, uh, reports uh, to the Board of Governors. And um, just for you to know, I think um, the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement and the additional protocol provisions broadly cover issues related to Section T. Um, and I think we will continue doing our work, and in parallel, we will continue exchanging views with the Joint Commission because the IEA cannot interpret provisions <coughs> of the JCPOA. Um, and I think so far we, we had a, a very good dialogue, an open dialogue with the members. The fact that uh, we all explain our views in such a way, I think, shows that we understand very well uh, where the issue is. Um, Dr. Blix, I'm very glad to raise the issue of the additional protocol. And I think the history of additional protocol, and Laura is here, she knows very well um, how this was developed. The history of the additional protocol, and this year we um, um, uh, commemorated 20 years since the additional protocol was created, uh, shows that it's a successful instrument. It's a very powerful instrument that has been applied consistently in a professional way by the IEA uh, over the 20 years. And it's quite remarkable that in this, uh, during these 20 years, we got to 129 member states uh, um, uh, implementing adi uh, uh, additional protocol, including Iran, provisionally applying it. And I think that, and here I'm dovetailing to a recommendation that Ambassador Bedenikov made in his paper uh, for this conference, aiming for the universalization of the additional protocol. So there is no doubt that the additional protocol is a very successful instrument. And it also brings with it what we all call the broader conclusion. Once a country gets a broader conclusion, or the agency draws a broader conclusion on the basis of the comprehensive safeguards agreements and the additional protocol, it means that um, uh, all nuclear material is in peaceful purposes. When it comes to Iran, of course, um, we implement the additional protocol um, in the same way uh, in Iran as in any other country. And there is no shortcut, and that's um, I think we'll, this is what will preserve the professionalism of the agency. One point on whether there could be some positive lessons from the JCPOA um, um, and the dealings between the Iran and the IEA, and I think there, could, there, there are many positive lessons. Not on the, um, that much on the, um, let's say, um, um, on the different uh, layers of the negotiations, but on, on the process. So first of all, what enabled progress, substantial progress on the JCPOA was this possible military dimension. What is important is to indeed to have dialogue, and dialogue not just for the sake of dialogue, dialogue to produce results. And um, in order to do that, you need to spell out very clearly what are the issues. And this is, I think, what, what has happened when Director General Amano presented uh, his report in 2011 to the Board of Governors. The second positive lesson is that uh, it is possible to combine different knowledge at the international level. On the one hand, we had the E3 plus 3 Iran track. The other track was the IA Iran, which is more technical. But I think all of us could benefit from the input from the others. The IA benefited quite a lot from the political uh, input that, and support we got from the E3 plus 3. And I think uh, we informed 
the discussions in the JCPOA uh, negotiations with uh, technical advice and provided our uh, own understanding of the issue. So uh, there are a number of positive lessons, difficult to replicate in other formats, and that's why I think we have uh, the CSA and the additional protocol, the overall uh, safeguards verification regime that uh, we developed with, with member states, and I think you, have, you made a very strong contribution. Thank you, Ambassador Firuta. I do see many hands in the conference room, uh, but we don't have time for any other questions. So I have to complete uh, a session now. Please join me to thank all panelists. I think it was an extraordinary session with architectures of the GCPOA. We will have other chances to discuss related issues, including during the next session, but with other panelists. The next session in this room will be on the role of sanctions. And I would like to remind to the media, this is the very final session which is open for coverage. All other sessions, until the very last one, are closed for media coverage. Please respect that. We will be back in 15 minutes, so please back to this room who are interested to discuss the role of sanctions. And please uh, use another room, which is called Petergovsky Sheremetyevsky, those who would like to discuss the role of nuclear weapons in national doctrines.